body. We got a small group, but intimate, but others may be, uh, I know this is a, um, and the finals and all of that, but I thank you for coming. Um, this is the, uh, I think everybody knows, I'm Ron Weisberger. I'm the director of the, what am I director of? The <laughs> Bristol Holocaust and Genocide Center. And um, we, you know, among other things, we do uh, pr these kinds of programming. This is the last program, obviously, of the semester. We have um, things we're planning for the fall, particularly a fundraiser around a, a drama, an original drama, which we'll be collaborating with the, uh, our theater program. Uh, so you'll be hearing about that. And um, so uh, anyway, we are fortunate today to, um, as our last speaker, to have uh, Manya Bark, uh, who I think many of you know, but uh, just to, um, well, before, I, as I usual, I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the college for the support and for the um, New Bedford Jewish Federation, which funds us, and then we also get individual contributions, which are always welcome, which are on our website if anybody wants to contribute. Um, but uh, we are, um, of course, one, we're only one of three in the state. I was just in Florida visiting uh, people in Miami who have a huge, you know, Miami is a big center, Jewish center, so they have some really interesting work, but it's a good model to work for, uh, work towards. So anyway, I want to introduce uh, Manya Bark, uh, who uh, usually described as an independent scholar, and she certainly is. She does incredible research. Uh, in so many different subjects. She and I have collaborated for a couple years now in teaching at the uh, Second Half Institute. Um, and uh, it's usually um, Manu who comes up with the ideas of what to do, and then I take half of it and do research. I've learned quite a bit just by doing that, and of course, for, for the kind of research that she does. So uh, just to mention that um, Manya has a... Uh, earned a bachelor's from the Freie University of Berlin and uh, a master's from, two masters actually, one from Monash University in Slavic Studies in Australia and another master's in comparative history uh, from Brandeis and uh, did additional uh, studies at Brandeis as well. So she has a solid academic background but she also has an incredible curious mind and she discovered I think, I don't know, you'll talk about it. The, the, the subject that she's going to be talking about today, someone that I didn't know about, and it's, it's amazing in this area, and uh, Howard Timberg is here. We've been teaching our course for 21 years now, Holocaust and history and literature, and yet keep discovering new things that I had no idea existed. So um, it's an ongoing subject, and Manya is contributing to that. So anyway, without me rambling anymore, I want to introduce Manya. <laughs> Good afternoon, it's great to see you all today on a nice sunny day. So um, today I'm going to talk about Fräulein Rabina Regina Jonas. Um, excuse the, the accent, but I can't quite, she was German Jewish and my native language is German, so it's easier for me to say her name in German. So, um, so in Judaism exists the idea that remembering a deceased person is akin to keeping them alive and honoring them. Many of you have probably heard the words given during Jewish, Jewish mourning, may his or her memory be a blessing, or may the memory of this righteous one be a blessing. In addition to this practice is the ongoing effort in Holocaust research to discover the names of all the victims, and on Yom HaShoah, say each one of their names while lighting a virtual candle for them. When we can no longer remember their names, they are lost to history and cannot therefore be a blessing to us. This almost happened to Fräulein Rabina Regina Jonas. She was victimized twice, once by the Nazis for being Jewish, and then again by the Jewish religious establishment because she was a woman and because she wrote her own history. Although there were survivors who knew Rabina Jonas, she largely remained a forgotten enigma because her life and work was almost completely annihilated in the massive destruction of the Holocaust. 
Few of her male colleagues remembered her, or perhaps wanted to remember her, and her papers were presumed to have been lost. It appeared that Jonas for many years had been forgotten to history, with no one recalling her name. In the meantime, Sally Jane Present was ordained as a rabbi in 1972 in Cincinnati, Ohio, and until fairly recently was presumed to have been, many, to have been the first female ordained rabbi. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989, the walls entombing Jonas's contribution not only to the rabbinate, but to the Jewish community in crisis began to crumble. Although there are approximately three to four brief references made of Jonas being a rabbi prior to this time, the rediscovery of Regina Jonas's literary work and rehabilitation of her correct position can be attributed to Dr. Katharina von Kellenbach, a researcher and lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Theology at St. Mary's College in the United States. She began researching the attitudes of religious establishments, both Protestant and Jewish, towards women seeking ordination in the 1930s Germany, her own native country. She traveled to the freshly reunified Germany in 1991, and in an archive in the former East Berlin, that had only recently become available to those in the former West was the archive that uh, von Kellenbach found. And in this archive was an envelope containing the only two photographs of Jonas, as well as her rabbinical diploma, teaching certificates, seminary dissertation, personal documents, as well as some of her, um, her uh, sermons. The papers that were presumed lost had been found. It is thanks to von Kellenbach's discovery that Regina Jonas is now more widely known and obscured no more. So who was Regina Jonas? Evidence is scanty at best. Little is available outside the government issued documents and censuses and a few statements made by those who knew her well. What we do know is that she was born to Wolf and Sarah Jonas in Berlin on August 3, 1902, in Mitte, Berlin, and grew up in the Scheunenwertel, literally the district of barns where horse barns had once stood. This was not the district of well-to-do Jewish Berliners, or even where any Jewish Berliner would care to visit. Tucked behind Alexanderplatz, poverty and crime were the rule of the day. It was dark and dingy, the majority of apartments lacked a sink or for that matter, any sanitation. Whole families lived in one room and shared a toilet in the courtyard, or if they were more fortunate, shared a toilet down a hallway. The population density of the Schoenwertel was five times higher than the average of Berlin. According to the Berlin records from before World War I, the family moved frequently about every two years. So here you can actually see um, some districts of, in Berlin. And this is the Scheunenwertel district of Berlin. What is indicated in these statistics is that the family, like many impoverished families, took advantage of the what's called the dry living principle. In this principle, poor families were permitted to live in newly built apartments until the walls had dried out and the apartments could be rented for a higher price. Living in these damp apartments before they had dried out was a disastrous to the inhabitants' health, and it would therefore have been no accident that Regina's father died of tuberculosis by the time that she had just turned 12. Amidst the misery of the Schoenwertal and its rep reputation of ill repute, it created its own genre of literature of nostalgia about the milieu or milieu by the likes of caricaturist Heinrich Ziller and the expressionist, um, you can see some, let me slow down. These are some pictures, photographs. You can see it's almost like the Lower East Side, if that's familiar to some of you. Um, and you had a lot of East European Jewish immigrants as well. You can see, but it, you can see the poverty. So these are Heinrich Ziller's drawings of the Schoenwertel. And he really captures in those caricatures the 
overcrowding. Also, he captures the Jewish inhabitants as well on the far left. And the desperation, really, of this district. Also, many of you have probably heard of um, Georges Grosch. He, too, drew inspiration from this district. Also, the journalist Josef Roth, who uh, no doubt you've probably heard of. And the uh, writers such as Alfred Dublin at the, also at the same time wrote about the Schönwartal. And he wrote the book Berlin Alexanderplatz, which if you know anything about Weimar Germany, it's probably required reading. Um, but at the same time that it was this place of crime and vice, it was also a place of Jewish piety. Even before the mass immigration and migration of Jews from the former Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires following the anti-Jewish violence in the wake of World War I, Jews had lived in the district. Amongst the houses and apartments, small private synagogues and prayer rooms were hidden. By the turn of the 20th century, the Schoenwertal increasingly took on an Eastern European Jewish flavor. Franz Kafka, Max Brod, both Jewish immigrants from Czechoslovakia lived and wrote while living in the Schoenwertal in the 1920s. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel moved there in 1927. He was an immigrant from Poland. Meanwhile, during this interwar period, the famous German-born assimilationist Jews, Martin Buber and Gershom Scholem, gave lectures and held discussions at the Volksheim, which was conceived as a space of exchange where German Jews could not only help East European Jews adjust to life in Germany, but also assist assimilated Jews from Germany in rediscovering the soul of their religion. By the time of the Kristallnacht pogrom in 1938, the mix of cultures had been destroyed. Regina's parents were not originally from Berlin, but they were also not refugees either. Her father, Wolf Jonas, was born in the German state of Pommern, or Pomerania, and his wife, Sarah, who was 33 years his junior, was born in Bavaria. Regina had a brother, Abraham, two years older than her. Unlike the majority of German Jews at the time, Regina's parents were orthodox, and the children were raised with a profound sense of religiosity. In a 1939 interview, Regina Jonas did not elaborate on what it meant for her to have grown up in a strictly religious home. However, for many German Jews, being strictly religious in the orthodox manner didn't at all contradict with being modern at the same time. On her birth certificate, her religion is listed as mosaic, a term that had replaced the word Jewish in official forms, and it also reflected the way most Jews, especially those in Berlin, saw themselves. Interestingly, the parents gave their only daughter a Latin name, Regina means queen, rather than a Jewish one like her older brother. This speaks volumes in itself and is in alignment with those of the German Jewish Berlin. It also seems from the evidence that she was not given an additional Jewish name in memory of a grandmother or other female relative as was common in Ashkenazic Jewish tradition. Several years later, some letters were written to her in Hebrew that address her as Rivka or Rebecca. Her Talmud professor, Edward Bennett, as well as her rabbinical colleagues referred to her by a Hebrew form of her name by calling her Malka. Yet another name appears on the original Hebrew rabbinic diploma, Reina, or pure woman in Yiddish, that sounds surprisingly like the French form of her name, also meaning queen, Reine. The death of her father on November 3rd, 1913, catapulted the family into an uncertain future, but at the same time set a fire within her to become a rabbi. It also set into motion, being born out of psychological trauma, a theme in her life, that is, relationships with much older father figures. Many were her, her rabbinic mentors, and one who has also become a lover in a tumultuous relationship. In the Jüdische Mädchen Mittelschule, the Jewish girls' middle school, which you can see here as it looks today, was housed in front of the Orthodox synagogue on the Kaiserstrasse, and which Regina attended during World War I. Students were impressed with her already boundless enthusiasm of anything that had to do with Judaism. 
Elsa Cooper, a former classmate, recalled how Jonas vied to be a top student in the subjects of Hebrew, religion, and Jewish history. As far as other subjects went, Jonas had less interest and was considered a mediocre student. Sarah Jonas, Regina's mother, said in an interview to a journalist who wrote an article after Jonas passed the rabbinical exam on December 26, 1935, that even as a little girl, Regina was already behaving like a minister, influencing her classmates. She, by all accounts, must have been a very convincing, as her classmates found nothing unusual about her career goal, nor did it occur to them that a woman would be barred from this goal. Even after World War I, when women in Germany were universally given the right to vote, not all university faculties were completely open to them. Despite the eventual access for women to all academic disciplines during the Weimar Republic, the role of a woman as wife and mother conflicted with those equal rights. Female teachers, for example, had to be single by law, and once married, they had to resign their position. Attitudes also took a lot longer to change than laws regarding voting rights. Within the Jewish community itself, women's suffrage took longer. Despite being able to vote in state and federal elections from 1919, Berlin's Jewish women could not vote in their own community parliament until 1926. For women, it was also a time of social upheaval. The surplus of women had increased after World War I due to the catastrophic loss of men in the trenches. Even middle-class women could no longer rely on marriage and many widows were forced to go into the labor market. At the same time, the first generation of female students had already entered the universities and could soon claim to be the first in their field. Regina left school on Kaiserstrasse in or around 1918 and for two years there is no record of her attending school at all until 1920 when she entered the pub public Oberlyseum, Ober which is a gymnasium or an academic preparatory school in Berlin Wiesensee. Despite her mother being dependent on social welfare, Sarah Jonas was able to create a relatively stable environment for her children and even moved the family to better accommodations in Prenzlauerberg, northeast of Alexanderplatz. Compared to the Schoenwalkel, this was a set, step up to a better neighborhood made up of working class and lower middle class. Here, Regina attended with her brother and mother. <laughs> so um, here, Regina attended with her brother and mother the Reichstrasse Synagogue, which was known as the, quote, synthesis between tradition and present. However, the synagogue, despite attempts, did not succeed in introducing what liberal or reformed Jews referred to as the Neue Reiters, or the New Rites. Despite this, Rabbi Max Weil was the rabbi of the congregation after 1917, and although he himself um, was many ways a traditional rabbi, he impressed upon the congregation the spirit of the synagogue, that is, synthesis between tradition and present. Um, and had a series of lectures related to the status of women. He also committed himself to the religious education of girls, including bat mitzvah celebrations, which was like a very new thing, as well as leading the girls section of the religious school. In 1923, Regina completed her graduation exams at the Oberseelim in Wiesensee. She continued her education at the school for another year with seminars in pedagogy and upon her completion in March 1924, received her teaching certificate for Lyzeen, which is high schools for university bound students. This offered her a future economic security at a time of political and economic insecurity, as well as the primary step involved in becoming a rabbi. Rabbi Dr. Isidore Blechorda of the Kot Busa Ufa Synagogue hired both Regina and her brother as teachers, despite his more conservative positions. If it had been up to Regina, she probably would have preferred the orthodox rabbinical seminary. But at the time, it was not open to women, and only two Jewish theological schools were open to women at all, one in Breslau and one in Berlin. Therefore, Regina enrolled in the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft der Judentums, or the Higher Institute for Jewish Studies, 
and began seminary courses for liberal rabbis and educators for 12 semesters. Regina proved to be quite a challenge to her professors. In a school where women attended to become teachers or lay people, Regina discussed openly whether women could become a rabbi and, it made, it, and made it known that this was the path she intended to take. She also declared her intention to take the rabbinical exam at the end of her studies, which caused consternation from many of her fellow students as well as her professors. At the time, she was the only woman amongst a group of men on this path. At the same time, she quickly drew the admiration of more open-minded men, such as Rabbi Dr. Leo Beck and the Talmud professor, Rabbi Dr. Edvard Barnett. In 1930, Edward Barnett, Regina's Talmud professor, who was also responsible for ordaining rabbinic candidates, permitted her to write her master's thesis, which was the final halakhic, which means according to Jewish law project, on the question which she had challenged, which had not only challenged her, but with all those she came in contact with, which was entitled, Can Women Serve as Rabbis? Barnard gave her a grade of good for her work. This work consists of 88 pages, is worthy of taking some time to examine. The treatise is a historical attempt to legitimize the rabbinical role of women and affirm the legality ability of women to perform most of the functions of a modern rabbi. What is unusual is that Jonas does not fall back on liberal Jewish arguments, but rather that her arguments are grounded in Jewish religious law itself. This, however, is in keeping with the character of Regina herself, who is orthodox in outlook, and therefore rejecting halakhic or halaha, or parts of the halaha, would have been anathema to her. Jonas was able to connect halaha and the emancipation of women while intertwining a conservative and preservationist approach with modern demands. In doing so, Regina rejected both the orthodox and reform liberal arguments and paved a third way. In addition, she insisted on the necessity of, females rabbi, of female rabbis, especially in the modern age. Regina was dealt a severe blow to her dreams when Edward Barnard died before her oral exams, which was a prerequisite for ordination. Barnard's successor, Professor Hanoi Albeck, refused to have anything do, to do with the ordination of women. Regina then only received a diploma as an academic teacher of religion. However, in defiance, she began to preach in small synagogues and continued to lobby rabbis and rabbinic institutions to grant her the full rights of rabbi. Rabbi Dr. Leo Beck supported Regina and provided her on graduation with an additional certificate for her completion for a homiletics course, The Art of Writing and Preaching Sermons, as well as attesting to her preaching skills. It appears most likely that Barnack was the individual who arranged for Rabbi Max Dienemann, the liberal rabbi of Frankfurt am Main, to give her the oral component of the examination and to sign the ordination. In December 1935, exactly one month after the Nuremberg Laws revoked her German citizenship because she was Jewish, she could officially claim to be the title of rabbi. Leo Beck, in a later date, letter dated December 31st, not only congratulated her, but gave her his blessings. Despite the seeming triumph, Regina was confronted immediately with new restrictions. Because her ordination had been overseen by Dinamon and was private, the Berlin Jewish community was not prepared to employ her as a congregational rabbi. Instead, they hired her as a teacher of religion and chaplain for social institutions of the community. The chaplaincy sent her to the homes of the elderly and the infirm, Jewish welfare and youth institutions, including various state hospitals, as well as the Jewish Hospital of Berlin. She also continued to advocate her for herself, despite the restrictions, by writing in the Central Verein Zeitung about her decision to become a rabbi. We have no way of determining how her career may have continued had the Nazis not unleashed their plans for the final solution and total war. Regina's persistence as lecturer, preacher, teacher, and pastoral counselor may well have earned her recognition and acceptance by the community and the community's leaders and acceptance um, 
and the possible appointment as a rabbi to a congregation that she fought so desperately for. However, instead, it was part of the brutality and chaos that was unleashed by the Nazis that unintentionally aided her quest and broke the determination of the Berlin Jewish congregation. Her abilities as a rabbi were acutely needed as the social and economic situation deteriorated rapidly under the Nazi regime that was bent on making conditions for Jews unbearable. In 1937, her contract was expanded to include, quote, other areas. After Kristallnacht and the mass arrest of Jewish men, including thousands of rabbis, her services became even more invaluable. As the deportations and immigration and arrest of Jews picked up speed, her presence was required more and more by the community. While the ideology of the Aryan or Germanic supermensch drove many non-Jews away from spiritual matters, many non-religious Jews became interested again and took pride in their religious heritage and values. The synagogues in a time of crisis were becoming increasingly important as a way to demonstrate human dignity. Numerous people began to urge Jonas to leave Germany, but she rejected all talk of this. Hagen expressed to Gad Beck, who wrote An Underground Life, who also worked in the same forced labor factory, which was mandated in 1942 for Jews who had not been deported, that she wanted to stay where her people were, like Leo Beck. In addition to this sentiment that she expressed to Gad Beck, was the fact that her mother still lived in Berlin and she had begun a relationship with Rabbi Dr. Josef Norden of Ham Hamburg, a man 32 years her senior in the summer of 1939. In 1940, the Reichsvereinigung, the Juden Deutschland, or the Union of German Jews, assigned her as a congregational rabbi to Waldsdorf, a congregation that was comprised of 21 suburbs. However, by the time she was assigned the position, there was little left of the congregational communities whose members had, immigration, who had immigrated or who had recently been deported. In the winter of 1940-41, Jonas had been forced out of her apartment by the Nazis into the so-called Judenhauser, or Jewish homes, where several Jewish families were forced to live in one apartment. By 1941, she had received additional work assignments and was traveling to Frankfurt am Main, Bremen, Stolpe, Wuthenbüttel, as well as some synagogues in Berlin. Regina Jonas's rabbinic work and responsibilities were increasing as Jewish institutions tried to confront and stall the full brunt of the Nazi assault. The Jewish institutions stopped at nothing, including the employment of a female rabbi, in their use of every available resource to counter the destruction being executed on them. By this time, the Nazis were deporting about a thousand Jews a day, mostly to the Regenstadt, but also to the Jewish ghettos in Wuj and Riga. Increasingly, trains were being sent straight to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Jonas's message to those under her pastoral care at the time was one of perseverance, trust, and courage in the face of Nazi anti-Semitism and violence. Some of her surviving sermons and letters that were deposited in the Jewish archives before her de deportation show that although she did not join any resistance group, she understood her resistance to Nazi anti-Semitism as an extension of her rabbinic role. Her continued message of faith in God, love of humanity, and hope in the future stood in direct contradiction to the Nazi ideology which saw the Jewish people and faith as a perversion of nature and the antithesis of their own worldview. Her sermons emphasized the mitzvah, or obligation to care for the sick and the elderly, which contradicted the Nazi ideology, which not only advocated for the health of the Volksbody, but also for eliminating the sick, weak, and those who could no longer contribute to society and were deemed, quote, useless eaters, end quote. For Jonas, Judaism was not about withdrawing from society or from the world's problems but an obligation to become actively involved in its betterment and repair, and that service to God was service to one's neighbor, especially the most downtrodden neighbor. In another lecture she gave, she revealed what is perhaps her most fundamental belief, that Judaism could, not, could be found in the very first sentences of the Torah. That's some of her handwriting. 
And I'm going to read here. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Here, faith becomes a mandate, the requirement of human beings to sustain the earth and establish the rule of God in the world. Learning is a commandment which applies to men and women in the same way. Learning, however, is not pure theory. At the end of learning lies the deed. In a nutshell, for Jonas, being faithful or religious meant being an activist. On November 3rd, 1942, Sarah and Regina Jonas were required to fill out the notorious Declaration of Property, including all her books, in an obvious prelude to imminent deportation. It appears as if, instead of taking her most important documents with her as most Jews did, she instead handed them over. Perhaps this was at Leo Beck's urging, as he had foreknowledge that the deportations ultimately meant death. Um, she handed them over to what remained of the Jewish community for safekeeping. The community then handed them to the Gesamt Archive der Juden, Deutschen Juden, the central archives of German Jewry. This archive was not destroyed by the Nazis, who instead planned to use it to document the, quote, vanished Jewish race, end quote, of Europe. What was left in their property was confiscated by the Reich and auctioned off for 142 Reichsmarks. The next day, they were arrested by the Gestapo and sent to the Samoslager, the former Jewish senior home, which had been turned into assembly center for deportations by the Nazis. On November 6, Sarah and Regina were deported by train. Regina's fiance, Rabbi Dr. Norden, had already been deported earlier that year in July to Theresienstadt and died only a few months after his arrival. Her brother Abraham, too, had been deported in October that year in the second Berlin transport to the east, which arrived in the Wuj ghetto. He never returned. Leo Beck would be transported to Theresienstadt on January 27th, 1943, where he became the head of the Judenrat, or the Jewish Council. And as such, he was somewhat protected and could also protect in a limited capacity. Regina's deportation to Theresienstadt did not end her pastoral work nor diminish her basic message. In a sermon attended by the well-known psychiatrist Victor Frankl, she denounced the bioeugenic vision of the survival of the fittest. She affirmed the dignity of each human as God's creation who must, be, not must, who must not be abandoned regardless of age, health, or mental capacity. To do otherwise would be forsaking God. She was able to defy genocidal reality by denying it the power to define her faith as well as her commitment to mankind. Later, Frankl appointed Jonas to his staff in addition to her job of receiving new transports from Germany and Austria to help reduce their shock upon arrival at the ghetto. Again, she ran into opposition when the head rabbi of Theresienstadt refused to recognize her rabbinical authority, but she did not let that stop her from going to the women's quarter, and from numerous accounts, the women appreciated and were pleased to see their rabbiren. Many times, they gave her a crust of their precious bread as a way of thanking her, and Regina, would always give that crust of bread to her mother, Sarah. Her message of hope and solidarity and perseverance became an act of defiance against the Nazis because it enabled those incarcerated to preserve their dignity and preserve their individual humanity in the face of a regime, intent as much of, on dehumanizing as killing them. While the machinery of annihilation was not stopped and did not stop even for Regina Jonas, her ministry did stop and help people successfully withstand the Nazis' attempt to turn Jews into the anti-race or subhuman vermin and destroy their humanity. As the Red Army ground their way westward and the collapse of the Third Reich became inevitable, the Nazis stepped up their efforts to complete the final solution. Beginning in September 1944, transports left Theresienstadt headed directly to Auschwitz-Birkenau. On one of the last transports on October 12th, 1944, Regina, at the age of 42, with her 68-year-old mother, was sent to Birkenau, the extermination camp, where most likely they were murdered within hours of their arrival. Before I end, I would like to end 
how I envisage Regina Yunus would have liked to have ended things. Not with her murderous death at the hands of the Nazi program of persecution and extermination, because she did not choose the time in which she was born and lived, but the fact that she dedicated her life to the renewal of Judaism. Enough traces of her life, sermons and treatises were found um, so that they, the next generation could learn from them once they had been rediscovered. Despite a deathly silence by the establishment that knew her before and during the Holocaust. I would like to point out that there were survivors of Tregenstadt, including Leo Beck and Viktor Frankl, her male colleagues. Neither of these men referred to her by name in their writings after the Holocaust. It was only after 50 years that Frankl remembered her when asked directly about her by Katharina von Kellenbach, the same woman who rediscovered Regina's papers. It was then he admitted that she was an energetic woman with a powerful and impressive personality. She was a trailblazer who carved out a path of independence, an independence of both liberal and orthodox approaches to Judaism at the time. She carved a third way. On the back of one of the photographs of her that was found in the archive, it reads February 18th, 1936, Rahnestrasse 3, junior sen Jewish senior home, Rosenberg, and written in Hebrew from the book of Exodus is the words, I shall be who I shall be. May her memory be a blessing. Thank you. So any questions? Questions? Ron, you have a question? Yeah, uh, yes, um, in German. I think, I'm not sure if it's been translated into English yet. There's also a children's, um, I discovered on Amazon, there's actually a children's short story that has been written about her. Yes, yeah. I'm not sure if it's if there's one in English or not, but there's there's not a lot of um, there's her papers that were found, and there's a few there's a few references to her from people, but there's not a lot of there's not a huge body of work at all. Um, there's also her letters to her fiance back and forth, um, but some of those are missing pages or parts are unreadable, so it's it's been. Um, a process to try and, you know, recreate her life. But thankfully it's being recreated. And I think part of that was, um, you know, you had the archives that were in the former East, East Berlin, where, um, you know, they were kind of hidden for a while. Um, and I think it kind of behooved the religious establishment to keep her kind of the lid on her. I mean, there were rumors even in the United States, even, um, 1968, um, there was uh, some references to her, but nobody knew for sure whether she had been ordained or not. Um, so there was kind of that. There was some confusion whether she had actually been ordained. But once they found the archives, um, Kellenbach, you know, found those archives, and then they saw the the um, the ordination certificate. It, there was no doubt that she was ordained. Yes, in the back. I'm curious. Why did Frankel not mention her? such an energetic force well I mean my opinion was you know who, who was going to who was left to talk about her and um, you know he had those 50 years to he, he I mean he wrote numerous articles he was interviewed numerous times and he he failed to to mention her yet he says you know eventually admits that what a, what an impact he had on she had on him um, I don't know if that was male ego or, or what that was, um, but it was a shame. Um, you know, she, she wasn't she she obviously wasn't a threat to him anymore. <laughs> um, so you know, to to keep her buried and and I think, you know, coming from a Jewish tradition too, that it, it's kind of even more shocking um, that you know, especially with that idea about saying one's name. You know, she had no one left. No one in her family survived, so there was nobody to say her name. Well, it's, it's a sad comment on him, you know, given his book, Search for Meaning. Absolutely. That he would deny her 
existence. Absolutely, and Leo Beck too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we all kind of hold the, these two figures up, um, and you know, Leo Beck too. Even though he really encouraged her, at the beginning of her career, um, and by all accounts, it seems like um, Gina Mann was a colleague and friend of his, um, because. Leo Beck was able to kind of straddle both the orthodox and the liberal traditions. Even though he was within the orthodox tradition, he had many colleagues and was well respected across the board. Um, and he opened that doorway for her um, to be ordained. Um, so you would have thought, given their relationship, that he would have at least mentioned her, but he doesn't either. So th there's this very profound and strange silence from these, these at least you would have thought were collaborators for her ordination in the beginning. There was someone, yes, Debbie. Yes, um, I take it there is no mention of her at all in either the uh, US Holocaust Museum or Yad Vashem. I think both of those now have recognized her. Oh, good. Yes, there, there's an exhibition at the um, Berlin Jewish Museum. Um, I think, if I go back. So here you can actually see there's a, so she has become, since 1991, uh, slowly but surely, um, she's been recognized. Okay. Yeah. But I think part of it's, you know, being the language barrier too, perhaps in the um, American context of things as well. Yes. Marty, I was just wondering if you've had an opportunity to look at um, any of her dissertation on the Holocaust around ordaining women rabbis. Yeah, um, it's fascinating. Um, so is it, how is it, go ahead. Um, well, there's a few things that, that's really interesting is that um, she goes into Talmud, mm -hmm. she goes into Halakha, mm -hmm. she also goes into obscure um, other, you know, religious texts. Um, she, she doesn't, Basically, when 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 uh, um, you know, if if halacha seems to indicate that they're not in favor of ordination for women, she kind of um, she's able to argue that this was because of this was opinion, not based in 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 theology. That this was opinion of the rabbis because at the time, it was considered. Um, the laws of separation or what could happen to a woman if she's in proximity of a man. And she's saying that because the times have changed and the position of women has changed, that this argument is no longer valid to keep women safe. Therefore, you know, it should be opened up to women. She also um, states that, you know, given modernity, um, you know, women have always been um, responsible for um, keeping a kosher home for teaching you know the basic tenements to the children before they they go off to Hebrew school so she's saying women from the get-go mothers from the get-go are therefore teachers and to be a teacher you have to be learned so to deny a Jewish woman the ability to learn the text is against halakha so women need to learn the text so that they can teach this to their children. And she also goes on to explain part of why I'm talking about Jewish renewal is um, she sees how modernity, especially in Germany, had created, um, you know, most Jews were liberal Jews. So they were no longer connected to their faith, no longer co connected um, strongly to their community or their, their idea of, of Judaism was come somewhat um, watered down. So she was saying that in order for this to change, for, for people, for Jews to be reconnected, for a renewal in Judaism, it's going to come from the women. Because if you don't educate the women, then they have no understanding of their own faith and cannot pass that down to the children and create an interest in Judaism. So we, if we do not include women, Judaism itself is going to face a crisis. So she really pushes this idea that there's nowhere rabbinically that it denies women uh, the ability to be rabbis. That women are educators, teachers, which means rabbi. Um, therefore, they need to learn the text. And those reasonings for 
you know, in the ancient world of denying women because of, you know, the whole, you know, not separation of women and men was no longer valid. Um, and women were needed more and more to, to be able to pass the, 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 uh, the education on down. And for, for the m women to teach a love of Judaism as well, that she felt was missing. That's so fascinating, that in the 1920s, mm -hmm. and here in the US, in the 1970s and 80s, they were dealing with the same issues for right. women, and the right. women who were ordained in the 70s and 80s had find, trouble finding a pulpit. Um, and then the same thing in the 90s for gay and lesbian rather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but here she was in the 1920s, it's fascinating. And that she took on the role, as Taraz has thought, of being sort of pastoral counselor for the people who were coming to meet that counseling desperately as they arrived at this strange right. place, not knowing what was going to, what the future held. And she kind of got a taste, very, yeah, right. she kind of got a taste of that prior to that when, you know, and, and by all accounts, those uh, teenagers that she'd come across um, in her life, including Gad Beck, they were really in awe of her, mm. that she really, um, she really kind of, most of them were not brought up in religious homes, but she really kind of, set the bar high for them and she, she showed them that it, it's, it's not something archaic, it's not something abstract, that it has real meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and she was really able to connect with these young people. Um, you know, she really had a voice, mm -hmm. um, which, which is really, you know, she, it was definitely her vocation, um, which is interesting because I, the first quote that I have, um, you know, she talks about, you know, you, you can't, you, you have a vocation that's unique to you, that is God-given to you, um, and that's another reason why she said you can you cannot mandate or, or dictate, you know, when, when you have this within you, what you're to do with it. You know, you can't say no. You, that's that's out of the question for you if it if that has been the seed inside of you. Um, so God has placed abilities and callings in our hearts without regard to gender. Thus, each of us has a duty, whether man or woman, to realize these gifts God has given, and that's. That's how she lived her life. She, she, even when she was told no, um, she, you know, she still went into synagogues, smaller synagogues, and preached. Mm. I loved her quote that quote you had of her at the end of learning things. The deep. Yeah. That's yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, her sermons must have been fascinating. You know? Yeah. I'm glad they're preserved in some. And she way. preserved them too. She actually, um, she went to the head office in Theresienstadt with the Judenrat, and handed them over, these are, these are my sermons, and, and they were preserved too in the Reichstag. So she, it's interesting, like uh, Viktor Frankl, one of his works he took with him to Reichstag and was lost, um, where she did not take any of her works with her. She deposited them, it was, um, which basically saved them, because if she had taken them with her, mm -hmm. who knows what would have happened to them, or whether other people would have buried them like they buried her name. And it was um, Leo Beck, there, there's strong indications that it was Leo Beck who, because of his position, had already been made aware that the transports would ultimately lead to death. So um, it's, it's generally supposed, because it, after she um, was requested to, to do the uh, registration of her goods, the very next day, she went and she handed her all her papers, letters, papers, you name it, whatever she had, mm -hmm. those two photographs, to the archive. So it's almost like she had a, a sixth sense. She knew what was happening. Yeah. yeah. And this was her way of keeping her name alive. Yes? So you kind of alluded to this. What, you know, what is her longer legacy? Um, you know, how have women, you know, been integrated? How has her physical life changed since this? Oh, I think, you know, what you're saying was right. It, it, you know, America had its moment in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, and it took that long. Um, you know, I think if, if she'd stayed alive, then, then perhaps that whole momentum would have, would, would have kept going, or if she had managed to, escape and come because she was you know they kept on telling her go to the United States go to the United States so I mean there's a, what ifs you know maybe women joining the rabbinate here in the United States would have happened in the 50s rather than the 
late 60s, 70s, um, a lot of female rabbis are finding a lot of um, a lot in her sermons um, and a lot in her writings. Um, and I think what what speaks more to me is that she did this third way, um, which I really like. I, you know, to be boxed into, oh, I'm orthodox, I'm liberal, I'm this, I'm that. You know, she she really stayed true to herself and her own convictions, which which to me is, is, is more than feminism. Does that make sense? And I like that. She paved her own way. She wasn't going to be told what her beliefs should or shouldn't be. She was living her own life. Yeah. Is her work collected in the group? No. No, not that I know of. Not that I know of. So with, how do you get access? I found her dissertation online through the, um, the Berlin Jewish Museum. Her dissertation? Her dissertation, yeah. yeah. But her other, the sermons? And some of the sermons are available online, some are not. So it def these things definitely need to be, and I don't think any of the sermons have been translated either, so they're still in German. And some are in Hebrew. In Hebrew? In Hebrew, yeah. So that's what you're going to do, right? <laughs> 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 Nobody needs to do this. Right? I'm going to jump her, what's it? But I mean, I think, that, no, seriously, somebody needs to put that over. Yeah. But I mean, I do know that the, you know, a lot of American rabbinical schools where women are, are being ordained are, you know, I've, I've, they've gone to Europe now, they've gone to Germany and kind of done the footsteps of Gina Jonas, and so she's kind of held up now as a hero amongst uh, American female rabbis. So she, she's no one amongst American female rabbis, um, but it's, you know, it's getting the word out to, you know, and I think too, you, we tend to have this America first kind of thing too. So, you know, the idea that there was, there was a woman that wasn't American that became the first rabbi, you know, is, is something else as well that kind of is a reason why she's been slow to be taken up by the American um, community. But um, I think that's, that's changing. That's really changing now. Yeah, and I, I think too, that, you know, this idea of a third way is something that's really kind of taking hold today that people don't want to be boxed in. People want to create their own, their own vision of their own future. Um, so I think you know that's resounding much more strongly as well. well. That's why we need a text, you know, a text where people can, <laughs> can read. Yes. <laughs> yes. Rather than being scattered. Yeah, my, I'm sorry. You would mention a woman, Elisa Klatek, or something. I thought you had said she wrote something about. Yeah, she she she's written some some things. I think she's she was a, a rabbi as well, uh -huh. American rabbi. She's written some things about her um, as well. So it wasn't a book that she wrote? I, I'm not sure if she wrote a book or not. I, I don't really know. I didn't look into that. I just wanted to kind of get the resources um, and go from bottom up okay. um, rather than top down. Well, um, I mean, a collected work, so. Uh, yeah. But she, I mean, there's been a few scholars that have looked at her. Kellenbach was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think hers was more of a, and she's a theologian. So she, you know, she's coming from a different angle. Mm -hmm. She's coming from a Protestant, uh, German Protestant mm -hmm. tradition, um, and she was comparing, uh, you know, what was happening within the, the the Protestant tradition, at the same time as what was happening within the Jewish tradition in, in Germany at mm -hmm. the time. But um, I must say, she's, she really did a lot to promote Regina Jonas and and bring her to life, mm -hmm. um, and the fact that she confronted Viktor Frankl too. I'm Yes. Yeah, German historian, theologian, philosopher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she's, she was at St. Mary's College. I think she's Professor Emeritus now. Where? She was at St. Mary's College. I don't know where that Maryland. is. Maryland. Maryland. Oh, she's here in the United States. Yes, yes. She's, she was born in Stuttgart. Um, but she was, I don't know if she was completing a PhD or what she was doing, but it was. And you know we can we can thank the Berlin Wall for, for coming down because too if the Berlin Wall had not come down, and if those archives had not been opened up, mm -hmm. 
you know, there, there still would have been a question, was she ordained, wasn't she ordained? Was it rumor, was it not rumor? Yes? How did she manage to build such a rapport with the people who were in prison, say, in Theresienstadt? I would imagine that those people thought God abandoned them and that they were stripped of everything. So was she just focused on the idea that your, your mind, it, you, they can't take your, your mind away? What, how did she establish this relationship with them? Do we know? She, she was, again, yes, you, they can't take your mind, they can't take your soul, they can't take your belief. And, you know, she was basically saying that our job as Jews in this world is tikkun olam, to repair this world. Um, and at this time, repair of the world is in, in drastic need. Um, so it's not that God has created this need. It's evil people or people, the Nazis that have created this vacuum that is godless, that is, is not recognizing um, human, the human capacity to change, but to change for the good. So, you know, this Nazi ideology, which was about destruction, was about the survival of the fittest, um, which was anti-clerical, anti-spiritual. She's saying that we need to counter that to bring, to bring about the repair. And everybody, every Jew, <clears throat> or every single human um, is responsible for doing that. She was very much focused on the humanity of, of every individual. Um, and that it was the responsibility of every human being to remain human because by being human you had the light of God within you and therefore you were bringing light to the world and not allowing the destruction um, by this, this force. How long was she in Theresa's Two years? Two years. Two years. Well, uh, she was sent in November 1942, and then uh, October 44. So, almost two years. I wonder when Mark Luther, you know, he's done a lot of work around Yes, her. yeah. Wonder, he's aware of her. That would be interesting to know. I'll yeah. ask him about that. Yeah. I mean, she was obviously, the fact that she worked with Franco yeah. means that she was, you know, anyone in the Judenrat would have known her. Um, because of that position that she, she was working with Franco. And the fact that she was out there greeting, well not really greeting, but you know, as the transports arrive, she's there basically as, as, a, as a, um, uh, a therapist for those that are getting off the trains, disillusioned, not knowing where they are, what's happening to them. You know, a lot of the Jews that were sent to Regenstadt were um, you know, what was considered privileged Jews. So these were generally older Jews. They were Jews that had, uh, were professors, war heroes, doctors, lawyers. These were the top echelons of, of Jewish society who had been used to, most of them, an upper middle class life. And then all of a sudden, here they are, you know, on third class carriages, dumped a mile away and being, you know, their, their belongings taken from them, finding themselves in this, you know, lice infested, brutal place. You know, how, how do you come to terms with that? And there she was ministering to these people, you know, giving them, giving them the solace and, and being an ear for them. And I think that was where she gained so much respect. Along with Leo Becky. Right, right, yeah. And Leo Beck, he, because of his position, he could put names or take names off the transports. Um, but he did not take her name off the transport. He survived there. He survived. He, you said he could have taken her off? He, yes, because he did have the ability to pressure the Nazis as to, I mean, he would have had to substitute her name for somebody else's name, but he could have taken her name off, off the... But in all fairness, I don't know whether he told her he could take her name off, but she, if her mother was going, then I think she would have gone anyway. So in all fairness, it, it, he might have offered her that. We just don't know, because he doesn't talk about it. And, and that's something that um, is frustrating that he didn't, in none of his writings does he even mention her. Uh, 
yet he'd had this relationship, intellectual relationship with her, colleague relationship with her since the, the late 20s, early 30s. You know, we're, we're talking you know, a good 12, 15 years. Well, thank you so much for introducing us to her. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I said, you know, it's an ongoing. You know, yes. There's, there's so much to learn. Right? 